afterwards go work at a big company where you can keep training and where you have a boss who's very experienced who can keep pushing you in the right direction. But I know that that's not, often not the case. Um, many of us, we're not going to be working for Google in Silicon Valley or for Facebook. Um, so we, if we want to keep getting better and keep becoming uh, or eventually become masters at what we do, we need to think about it uh, and go about it deliberately ourselves. So this talk is about how you can continue learning even after you've just started. Cool. But to keep things interesting, let us start with a quick trivia. Who can tell me when was Python created? How old is Python now? Do I have any takers? Anyone? 99. Okay, we have 99. You're wrong. 1978, maybe. Okay, you're also wrong. <laughs> Anyone else? 89, you're close, you're close. You get a prize. Cool, and you are only a prize from yesterday. Okay, so, uh, some people think that Python was started in 1991, but actually it was started um, earlier than that. Who started Python? Who can tell me who created it? Say again? Guido van Rossum. No, you're wrong. Anyone else? You cannot try twice. You've already been wrong. <laughs> Python was started by this guy in the 1970s. Few people know this. Yeah. So actually he started Python as a side project while he was doing um, action movies. <laughs> this guy is just so cool. He just created Python uh, on the fly. Um, and it's only much later in 1991 when this uh, Dutch guy discovered the code and he released it as Python under his own name. But we all know it wasn't really him. So this is Guido van Rossum. Um, cool, so that is the trivia for the day. The, the point is we all want to be like that guy, and we all want to be great at coding. None of us uh, start out wanting to be mediocre developers. Um, and it's really difficult to do that if you don't keep working at it very hard. Um, how do you become a master at software development? Um, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. You just keep working very hard for a very long time. I don't know if you remember Karate Kid, but it's wax on, wax off. And you keep doing that, and you keep doing that, and you never ever stop. So, um, for example, Mike, uh, he's probably the guy who knows the most about coding uh, at this conference. And if you ask him when he started, he started in the 80s. That guy's been coding and coding and coding and he hasn't stopped. And that's how you become a master. It's not some magical lightning bolt that's got to come from the sky. And it's not necessarily talent. You have to be talented, you have to be smart. But beyond that, you have to work very hard for a very long time. Um, who of you know this guy? He's an author. His name's Malcolm Gladwell, and in one of his books he talks about um, this thing he calls the 10,000 hour rule. Um, now it's not a scientific rule or anything, but they went and studied a lot of people who had become masters in their fields, across many di different disciplines, and found out that it takes roughly 10,000 hours of concerted learning before you become a master. So some interesting examples of this include um, Mozart, um, if you know anything about Mozart, they'll say he was a, a boy genius, he was a, a real prodigy. He started composing um, piano concertos when he was like 11 years old. But if you study his work, most of his early stuff is really bad. And a lot of it, the stuff that was a little better, was mostly copied from other composers and just rearranged a bit. His first concerto that was really a masterful work 
uh, that was also original was written when he was 21. And by that time, he had already been composing for 10 years. So it took 10 years for Mozart to be this kind of mediocre guy who's copying everyone else before he had his first masterful work. And after that, he pushed out a lot of great stuff. So if you've started coding, you've started last year or the year before, and you're not yet great, that's normal. Don't, don't think it's because you're stupid. Another example is the Beatles. One of, well, probably the most successful band yet. So they burst to fame um, in 1964 when they traveled to the US for the first time. But few people know that before that they had been playing together for many, 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 um, many shows, um, several years. What they did is they, um, they were contracted to go and play in strip clubs in Germany. And these strip clubs would just have them play for hours and hours and hours. They were just there to, to get people in the door and keep them entertained. So they would play for four hours a night or eight hours sometimes every night, just day in and day out. And that means they got a lot of practice. So by the time that they got famous, they had already played more than 1,000 performances together. So that's more than 1,000 performances before they were big and famous and everybody knew them. They were mediocre for a very, very long time and they were comfortable with it, but that's how they found their own voice and that's how they became the Beatles. This guy is a software developer, Bill Joy. Um, he's credited with writing Unix, uh, which forms the basis of Linux and Android and iOS. So we all use his software every day. Uh, he did that at a very young age. I think he was also in his 20s. Uh, he also started Java. He's the guy who, who wrote Java. So you might think that this is one incredibly talented guy. And yes, he is incredibly talented. But if you look at his history, he was all in also incredibly lucky. He started at an early age. His parents got him a, a nice computer. He happened to go to a university that had a very early um, timeshare machine that he could work on. And they happened to have a system that, that allowed him as a student to go play on this big expensive machine for hours on end. And by the time that he started writing really good programs and started redoing Unix, um, he wasn't new. He'd already spent about 10,000 hours practicing. And he didn't see himself as a good coder before then. He was not the boy genius necessarily. Okay, cool. So if you want to improve yourself um, and you Luck is not necessarily on your side. Um, how do you go about getting better at what you do as a programmer? There are lots of resources out there, and you need to be clever about which ones you choose, because they're all going to eat up a bit of your cash and a bit of your time, and you only have so much cash and so much time. The first place you can go is books. So there are many different O'Reilly books out there with all sorts of technical topics. Many of them are Python related. Um, so read some of them and actually go and read all of them. You know, if you want to really master the field, there is no shortcut. There is no way that you can just say, okay, there's just one book and then you're going to be okay. You really need to know what goes on in most of these things. Um, but reading books can be very time consuming. So I haven't read all of these. Um, another place you can go is podcasts because then you can download stuff to your phone and then at least you can listen to it when you're in a taxi or when you're traveling somewhere. There aren't very many good podcasts that I know of, but the one that I really like on Python is called Talk Python to Me. It's quite recent, I think it's about two years old or so. Um, and it's done by this guy called Michael Kennedy. But he goes and he talks to some of the, some of the key figures in, in Python, some of the um, people who who started specific packages or were well, very, um, very active. So, so they, they give you a unique, ex, uh, a unique kind of perspective on things uh, that you wouldn't necessarily get from me. You know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't write Python, but this guy goes and he talks to the people who do. Um, so that is very useful. OK, and then there's this one website. It's called the Python Guide. Uh, it started by a guy named Kenneth Wrights. Um, do any of you, have, have any of you heard of the requests package that you use for doing HTTP requests in Python? 
I see one head nodding. So request is the most popular Python package outside the standard library. It's used for, for doing web requests and it's, it's very well done. And it was written by this guy called Kenneth Wright, who works at Heroku. I think he still works there. Um, but he also made this Python guide project on the side. And what it is, it's a website that gives you an opinion on specific technical topics. So say you want to build a, a website, you can go to Python guide and look in the website section and he'll give you an opinion. He'll say, for these types of websites, you should probably use Django. For these types of websites, you should probably use Flask. Now, he's not going to teach you Django or Flask. You can do that yourself. But he's going to point you in the right direction. So if you don't have a boss that's very experienced with Python, or you don't have an older brother that's a boy genius or something like that, if you're a normal person, then this is a very useful place to, to kind of make up for that mentorship that you could have found somewhere else. Um, so it was also called the Hitchhiker's Guide to Python at a certain stage. So you can Google it. And what's very nice about this website is um, you'll see if you visit it, there's a link where you can download the whole thing as a PDF. The whole thing. And then you've got it on your machine, even when you don't have internet. If you look at the, in uh, at the content, he starts off um, with the real basics, like which interpreter should you use? 2.7, 3.4, 3. .4, 3. .what? How does it work? How do you actually install it? What's the difference between installing it on Mac and Windows? That kind of stuff. So that's really useful practical advice that it gives you there. And then it's kind of the overarching, how do you do things um, as a Python developer? How should you structure a project? What should your code style look like? How do you do documentation? How do you do testing and logging? So those kind of things are also very, very useful. Even if you have already been coding in Python for a while, just to go back and refresh and see how other people out there do it. And then he goes on for the real meaty stuff. So here, just about any project you want to take on is going to fit somewhere in there. And um, for example, say you want to learn more about databases. You're wondering whether you should be using NoSQL or whether you should be using MySQL or PostgreSQL. If you go there, he'll tell you what the difference is between them and what to think about and where to start. He's not going to teach you the details, but he'll point you in the right direction. The same for things like image manipulation or machine learning or web applications, network applications, all of these kind of things. So it's really, really useful resource. I would suggest you check it out. OK, and then lastly, this is my weapon of choice when it comes to becoming a ninja. If you're reading books or you're reading blogs or those kind of things, your mind can only process so much text um, at a certain time. You know, you can sit and read a book for a whole day and then sometimes it feels like you've forgotten half the book by the end of the day already. So uh, videos, on the other hand, um, can transfer a lot of information very quickly. You have someone speak, uh, especially videos of tech talks. So you have someone speaking on a specific technical topic and you can hear what he's saying, but you can also see the slides, and you can also read body language. So you can very quickly figure out, kind of, should you take this person seriously? How does this fit in? Is this going to be useful? And the key thing is as well, if it's a video of a, of a tech talk, um, is you can turn it off whenever you want. If you start watching a video and you realize halfway through, this is some completely different topic, this is not something that's going to be useful for my project, you skip on to the next video. So it's not like here, yeah, where half of you want to leave, but you feel, you feel too polite. Um, so specifically go for um, videos of Python conferences. So we're at PyCon Zim, which uh, is one of the annual Python conferences. Now there's at least 400 annual Python conferences. So some of you might have been to Python Cape Town, uh, or, or PyCon ZA, and you might think that's a very big conference, but it's not. We have about 200 or 250 people this year, I think. Um, there are much bigger Python conferences around the world. Uh, there's PyCon US, which I think is the biggest. I think they have somewhere in the region of two or 3,000 people attending. There's EuroPython. There's a conference specifically for Django. Um, there's conferences specifically for scientific Python, if you want to do a hardcore number crunching. And if you want to do big data stuff, 
there's conferences specifically on that. And if you go to that website, pivideo.org, it literally gives you a list of all of these conferences. And it gives you links to all of the talks. So all of those talks are on YouTube somewhere. The question is how to find them. At pivideo.org, they literally list all of them. It's an incredible resource. So it looks like, uh, yeah, OK, cool. It's a very good resource. So after you watch some talks, um, the next step is to actually watch videos of tutorials from these conferences. The tutorials are incredibly useful because in a talk, it's maybe 30 minutes or so. A guy can only give you so much information in 30 minutes, and then the rest you have to go and find yourself in the documentation, or you have to start playing around. But in a tutorial, they can last for two or three hours. So if you do a tutorial on Postgres, for example, he's going to take you through this, the syntax, but then he's also going to go really deep and tell you how do you replicate these things, um, how do you scale these things, how do you do sharding, how should you think about all of these things. And that's stuff that you can't really um, convey in 30 minutes. So instead of um, just trying it out yourself and bashing your head for weeks and weeks, work through one of those tutorials right at the start when you're just getting into a new technology. And then that just helps you um, build a framework to put, to put the information in. So this is what it looks like at PyCon US. This is the biggest Python conference uh, as far as I know. People pay 150 or $200 to attend the tutorials. And then um, they have nine tutorials running simultaneously for two days. So at the one that they held this year in, Port in Portland, they have one, for example, on machine learning. They have one that's a Python boot camp that's kind of introductory. Um, they have one on getting started with Git, if, you want to, if you're not comfortable with your version control skills. There's one for Flask that's only doing that. And he does that for three hours. Then they carry on. And then there's, um, there's Ansible. There's intermediate Python uh, programming. There's regular expressions. That's something I still struggle to wrap my head around. Um, it carries on. There's a, the next day, there's a, a Django tutorial. There's uh, one on Bayesian statistics, which is very useful if you know how to or where to use it. And things like efficient Python for high performance parallel computing. So you can see that there's a very broad spectrum. There's everything from the introductory stuff to like the really, really advanced stuff that you need if you want to solve a specific problem very well. And they do that for two full days. Um, in the last row there, they have one on test-driven development. That's very good to watch. I've, I've seen that one. Yeah, and, the, and for example, one there about deploying and scaling applications with Docker, Swarm, and a tiny bit of Python magic. So that kind of things um, are really, really practical and really, really useful. And that's only the tutorials. So then the talks start. They have um, keynotes and those kind of things. The very first talk uh, after the keynotes was machete mode debugging, hacking your way out of a tight spot. And you'll see that all of these talks are either intermediate or novice or expert, but they actually market for you so you can know what to expect. And then it just keeps going and going and going for three full days. They have five tracks. So you can imagine that there's a lot of, um, a lot of information being exchanged. And for us, uh, watching it over the internet, there's the opportunity to really pick out the parts that's going to be really useful for, for ourselves and only watch that. You don't have to sit and watch through all the other stuff that it doesn't apply to your field. Um, yeah, so it just keeps going on and on and on. So in total, at PyCon US this year, they had 36 three-hour tutorials and then 96 30-minute talks, which is a lot. So that all adds up to 156 hours of entertainment. So stop watching those series. Stop watching Mr. Robot or Orange is the New Black or whatever it is that you're watching. There's 156 hours of PyCon US entertainment out there for you, and it's free. 
Um, so this is what the Pi video website looks like, uh, where you can find links to all of these talks. So it literally lists all of the conferences and, and each year that that conference has been recorded. But if you scroll to the bottom of the page, there's this interesting link where it says Pi Video Data. If you click on that, it takes you through to the GitHub repo where they actually store the data that this website is running on. You can download that GitHub repo. It's, it's free and it's open. And in there, it looks like this. So for each, for each um, conference, there's a, there's a folder. And inside, there's a list of JSON files for each talk. So for each talk, there's a JSON file that tells you, um, it gives you a description of the talk, the title, and importantly, it gives you a link to where that video is hosted. So here you'll find a YouTube link, for example. So if you're clever, you're going to take an hour or two out of your day and write a little Python script that goes and strips out all of those links and downloads all of those talks to your hard drive. Then you don't have to worry about internet connectivity. Uh, you just download everything. Just do it. Um, all, all in all, that comes to about 50 odd gigabytes. So. 50 gigabytes is not free, um, and sometimes connections drop and so on, so it can be a bit tricky. So I did bring a few dumps of those videos with me. So the, the SD cards that I handed out just now, um, the one is for PyCon US 2016, and the other one is for PyCon US 2015. And it's a whole dump, it's 50 something gigs with all of the talks, all of the tutorials, all of the good stuff. What's also on there is the PDF version of the Python guide, and then just the PDF version of the schedule, so that you can figure out which talks to, to watch. I do have a few more of those copies with me, so if you feel you really want one, please just come tell me. And then I gave Ronald a version of the 2016, so you can copy it from him as well. And I gave Anna a version of the 2015, so you can take your laptop to her and copy it from her as well. It is a lot of gigabytes, so it takes an hour or two to copy. So don't be in a rush. Cool, and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Pleasure. I'm one of those people who still feel that I have a, lo a really long way to go. So it was very inspiring to know that there's a lot of us out there who still have like a very long way to go. And the nice thing is that she did give a list of all like the resources that one can use to, you know, better themselves. So thank you so much. Cool, it's a pleasure. Questions? Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, Petrus.